All right, so I have a little possibles box right here. It's full of primarily patches and a few cleaning uh, brushes, some cloth to wipe down the parts with, and just kind of ancillary stuff like that. So I'm going to select a few of these cotton patches. That's probably way more than we'll need, but we'll set them out there. There's a set of brushes and jags that I like to use. Nylon brush for brushing out parts and getting the carbon to fouling off of them. And I like to set up a couple of rods for use in cleaning the bore. First of all, is that a loaded gun? Uh, yeah, it is because number one, all guns are always loaded. And because this gun is a self defense weapon for the owner. Here we can see the chamber is empty. He keeps it loaded all the time and I don't intend to instruct him to do any different. So let's put a rod up the bore and you can see that rod in there. So that chamber is empty. All the ammunition has been removed from the gun. Now we'll remove it from the magazine and we'll place the ammunition into this gun rug zip it up, put it out of the way. So, no ammunition in the magazine, no magazine in the well, and we already demonstrated no ammunition in the chamber, so this gun is safe to work with. I'm going to take the possibles box and set it aside so I have a little bit more room on my work table here. I'm going to select a jag from my collection here, one of the appropriate size, will be that one right there. That's for 40 caliber and up. And also a phosphor bronze brush. I use these uh, pickups or these hemostats to generally to clean with as well and you'll see that in a little bit. So we have a JAG phosphor, bron phosphor bronze brush, that's easy to, for me to say. Phosphor bronze brush, yeah. This thing right here and we have the nylon double-ended brush. All right, so I'm going to screw on the brush to the end of this cleaning rod. The universal thread on that, so it takes just about any cleaning brush or jag there is. Same thing for this. This is an old outers cleaning rod. I'm going to take this particular spiral stainless steel brush off of here because it's been mashed and compressed and it's too small to fit the 45 caliber bore. And we're just about ready to go. One other thing we have, this is an old uh, oiler bottle from um, I believe it came with an SKS that somebody had and didn't need. I have put some Hoppy's number no. 9 solvent in there and so that's what I'm going to use today. But before we go any further with that Let's disassemble this. So we've demonstrated that this pistol is unloaded. What we're going to do is release the slide. And it doesn't really matter if the hammer is full cock position or not for disassembly. You can let it down. So right here is the disassembly notch and that allows the slide release to it's actually easier when the hammer's back. It allows the slide release to come out. So what I'm doing is advancing, or retarding rather, bringing back the slide to where that notch lines up with the little tab on the slide release lever. And then I'm going to push in on the opposite side of that. This is also the pin that goes through the barrel link. And I'm going to push in on that and we'll see that pop out a little bit. There it goes. We remove that, set it aside. What I like to do next is take tension off the spring. So what I'm going to do is press in on the, the spring guide plug, rotate the bushing clockwise, release the tension, and see there's the plug right there. There we go. That came out pretty quick anyway. I'm going to take the spring out. Set those two parts there. 
and then we'll rotate that counterclockwise and jiggle it till it comes out. So this is the barrel bushing. And then the slide will come off the frame quite easily. There's the spring guide. Slide comes off. We'll set the frame down. There's the barrel. Here's the barrel link. This one is a pinned link. See that right there? We rotate the pin forward towards the muzzle and lift that up slightly until we can slide it forward. And out. So there we have it. So this is the basic field stripping. That's all you need to do. So we have the frame, which is all one assembly. The frame can be taken apart into lots of other parts, but that's not what field stripping is about. So we're not going to disassemble it any further. <laughs> Feed ramp quite dirty. The rails are dirty. See my fingers already got a substantial amount of carbon fouling on it just from handling this. So that's all the disassembly that's needed. Here's the slide. Contains the firing pin assembly. Firing pins back here. Sights. Ejection port. And the, the grooves for the slide rails. This is the barrel and the barrel link. And it also has a slight bevel on it that matches up with the feed ramp when it's inside the frame like this so that the bullet will climb right out of the magazine and into the chamber. This is the chamber end of the barrel and this is the barrel itself. Inside of here is the rifling. These are called lugs and they line up with some grooves in the slide itself and they tend to along with the pin and the barrel link lock the slide and the barrel together as they travel rearward under recoil until the bullets out the barrel and the pressures have subsided to a safe level then the barrel stops and tilts a little bit slide continues back extracts the fired round ejects it and then under spring tension goes back forward again strips a new round off the magazine if there are still ammunition remaining in the magazine feeds it into the chamber and you're ready to shoot again if there's no round remaining in the magazine, then this little part right here, probably, I don't know if you could see it or not, there's kind of like, this is the follower in the magazine, there's a little part right here, impinges on a another part um, inside the slide release, and that locks the slide release, which is also called a slide lock lever sometimes and causes the slide to remain open so you know you're out of ammunition at that point. I usually like to clean the, bar the barrel first. So we're going to do that. I use a dry brush first on it. Pass that through there a few times. I use it dry first to kind of loosen up any particulates that are in there. After that, some people don't like to do this but it doesn't bother me much. I dip the phosphor bronze brush in the Hoppies number no. 9 give it a couple of twirls in there so that most of the excess comes off doesn't drip off the end of the rod and make a few more passes down the bore and I don't know if you can see there but it's spraying a really fine spray of kind of blackish matter onto the pad that I have on this table. Hoppy's number nine smells kind of like bananas, overripe bananas possibly, and it also has kind of a petroleum sort of a smell. I kind of like it, other people don't. Alright, so the next thing we're going to do is take a patch and we fold it in half so it's tight fit when it goes down the bore. Put a little bit of hoppies on there. And we'll line that up with the chamber end. Take the jag that's meant for pushing patches. 
and start it in there. Give it a little bit of a brisk scrubbing and that patch will come out looking about like that. Now I happen to know that my buddy was shooting all jacketed rounds, full metal jacket and even plated rounds, so we're not going to come up with any lead, uh, metallic lead anyway, in the rifling. So what I'm doing here now is just kind of rubbing this patch around the area of the feed ramp. And I'm not sure, but I think this little cut right here, let's see if you can see it better there. Try a clean one. The little cut right there, I believe, may be functioning as a loaded chamber indicator. But those who subscribe to Colonel Cooper's Four Rules of Firearm Safety uh, don't need that because they know that what? All guns are always loaded. It doesn't matter if the chamber indicator says so or not until you personally check the chamber and determine its status, it's loaded. Now when the gun is disassembled like this, I think, and you've been working with it, and you personally are looking at it, it's been in your hands and hasn't been out of your sight, you can assume that it's not loaded because you personally unloaded it, took it apart, and it hasn't been out of your sight since. Alright, now I'm going to fold a clean dry patch and run it through there a few times. Again, kind of scrubbing a little. And look at there. Now some of that is going to be debris that was on the brush because uh, this bore is pretty clean right now. But when the brush goes through there it does leave a little bit of carbon uh, fouling because it's still wet from the poppies number nine. And the next thing I do typically is take a little bit of this uh, rock and roll lubricant and put a little bit of that on a patch. And I've found over time that this really, really loosens any remaining fouling that might be in the bore in the rifling. So this one will probably come out with a little dirt on it or a little bit of carbon fouling. Not much though. See that? Well, that bore is pretty darn clean and uh, I know in the instructions for maintenance on these guns, and most guns, the manufacturers tell you to push a clean patch through the bore until it comes out without any fouling on it. It comes out clean, uh, just as clean as it went in, I guess. And we're getting pretty close to that point with this one. And I'm going to call it good. There's an old saying, good enough for government work, right? Well, this is a government model 45 automatic. So we'll call it government work. So this is a stainless steel barrel, but I'm still wiping down all the surfaces with this red lubricant and oil because it does tend to remove some of the remaining fouling that might be on there. Now the barrel link goes back and forth in a little groove right here, and I'm going to brush in there just in case there's any fouling in there. And then I'll kind of feed this patch in there a little bit and run it through. I think we got a little bit of dirt out of there. So I pronounce this bore now to be clean. Let's see if I can show you a clean and shiny bore. There you go. So we'll set that aside. That's done. What I like to do next is just give the magazine a quick brush. Uh, this magazine I don't believe has been fired enough to warrant taking it apart and cleaning the inside of it. That can be done. But what I'm doing right now is just cleaning the surfaces of the follower and the lips of the magazine with this red lubricant soak patch and I like to get in there with this end of the brush and kind of work it around in there a little bit and that'll probably do for the magazine this particular magazine holds seven rounds they do make uh, magazines for Colt 
45 ACP clones like this that hold 8 rounds, and even some that hold as many as 20 or more. Now what I'm going to do with this patch while it's still got some oil on it is go after the slide rails and the ejector and get some of the major fouling off them and also the channel where the spring goes and I like to take the nylon bristle brush and clean in there in case there's any particulate fouling that the patch didn't get get the hammer and I get the channels that the rails have underneath them, the slide rides in those channels here are the slide rails and then there are some channels in there that match up with actual um, rails inside molded into the slide so we kind of have a double locking system very solid tried and true design this particular type of firearm was designed by John M. Browning around the turn of the last century so that would be around 1903-1905 in that area so this firearm is pretty much, the frame anyway, is pretty clean. So what I do now is take this lubricant soaked patch and go down here inside the magazine well because sometimes some powder gases will go down in there and you can see it's coming back with a little bit of fouling on it, not much. And I like to put a drop of oil or lubricant on the hammer. There's the pin that holds the hammer in there. And where it rotates around that pin, that lubricant will get in there and kind of smooth things up a little bit. Anyway, um, so much for the frame. We call the frame clean. Uh, towards the end of the process, I go over it with a dry patch and remove some of this oil, um, this lubricant that I'm putting over the exterior. So, I'll set this frame aside over here, along with the barrel. Now, since I have this lubricated patch, what I like to do is fold it in half like this, and run part of it into the, the gap in the spring, kind of pinch it over, and turn the spring clockwise, which advances it down that patch, like so. And that lubricates and cleans the spring pretty well. And you can see this right here, this um, little line of fouling came off the spring. So the spring is now lubricated and cleaned. And using that same patch again, we'll wipe the slide release lever and barrel link pin. It's all one assembly. And there's a little groove in there. And I like to try to get that clean as well. So that's clean. For the spring guide plug or the spring plug, I usually will take a smaller bronze brush, maybe the jag. There we go, wrap it around the wrap it around the patch like this and rotate it inside of there and that kind of puts a little bit of lubrication inside of there and also removes any fouling that might have been in it and then I like to give the knurled surface a little bit of a brushing and wipe it off a little bit so plug is clean now the barrel bushing. This has a lug right here that matches up with a groove inside of here just behind where the sight is or just just forward of it I guess. 
that lug is just about even with the end of that sight. It's hard to see where you are, but it's hard to see where I am. But anyway, the barrel bushing locks up in there with that lug. So we'll kind of do the same thing with it. And so it's now good enough. Spring guide, this is a standard spring guide. It's a little short. I like the full length ones. I just haven't had the wherewithal to buy him one. But I'm going to suggest it. He has had the foresight to in the past allow me to put a shock buffer in there. And this kind of saves a little bit of wear and tear on the frame when it slide comes back and hits against the frame. This is kind of a nylon sort of closed horseshoe shape buffer shock absorber and it kind of eases the wear and tear on the spring guide and also on the frame. Where this goes when it's all together is right there. Oops. Right there. Only it's like that. So when the slide comes slamming back it kind of puts a little bit of force on this and a little bit of force on here. And so this lays in there like that and cuts the cuts the uh, battering of those parts together by quite a bit. So there's an impression on this, both sides of this, where it's taken some of that ramming force. These are usually good for several hundred shots and then they tend to come apart and you have to replace them. Uh, these are made by King's Gunworks, I believe. They may be manufactured and sold by other concerns. This one's got several hundred more rounds of life left in it by my assessment. I've used those for years. I know what they are capable of. And last but not least with the spring guide I like to take the patch and sort of ease it on down inside of there and from both ends. Sometimes I'll just use one tooth of the clamps. Sometimes I'll use a 22 caliber cleaning rod to go down in there and get that clean. So those small parts are done. Now all we have left to do is the slide. First thing I like to do is get inside of there with a patch that has some kind of lubricant or solvent on it and the brush and brush around in there. Look at that. See how badly fouled that is. And that's just from around the extractor and firing pin hole and the ejection port. But that's where a lot of the powdered gases wind up escaping the system. They either come out there or they come out through the bore. Hopefully most of them come out through the bore. Because otherwise it's rather a violent release of gas under pressure if it wants to come out through the ejection port. Some of it does. If you look at slow motion videos of a 45 auto or any automatic, semi-automatic self-loading pistol uh, firing, you'll see a certain amount of fire and brimstone coming out of the ejection port, but nowhere near the amount that comes out the end of the barrel or the, the muzzle. We'll wipe off some of the exterior here where I could see there was some powder fouling, carbon residue. See how dirty that patch is getting now? It used to be pretty clean. Now originally when these guns went through their military trials, the 1911 and 1911 A1, there's a lot of proofs that they have to go through that they can withstand being dirty and fouled with all kinds of junk and gunk. I think they put them in a cement mixer full of muddy sand and take them out, shake them out, and then load them and fire them, and they have to be able to function like that. So the um, fitting on the older 1911s that were actually military pistols, pretty loose, and you can shake them and they rattle and clank around. 
but they still work. They're made with loose tolerances on purpose so that they can tolerate uh, what might come their way from use in the battlefield, being dropped in the dirt and so on, and still function and still potentially save a soldier's life in battle. So I'm thinking this is pretty clean. I like to get inside of the lugs where the barrel lugs line up. There's grooves in there and kind of clean them out and you can see right there there's two black marks where I just did that. And I also like to wrap it around a screwdriver, just gently go through the rails down inside of these grooves where the slide rails go and the ejector groove. Kind of do around the sights a little bit. They usually don't get too dirty. All right. So this gun is fairly clean. I have a reasonably clean patch here. I got it dirty a little bit by handling it. So we're going to wipe all these surfaces down. That red lubricant leaves a fine layer of lubrication on things, but you'll see in a few minutes I'll add some more. So I'm not actually going to take all the lubrication out of here. I'm just getting the excess right now. So, you can see there was still a little bit of fouling in there, even there. Some of that has come from the brush, but some of it did come from the slide. Alright, so, let's review the parts once again. We have the slide assembly, complete with sights, spring, spring end plug, spring guide, and shock buff. And I'm going to put that back on there. Barrel and barrel link assembly, the frame, and this is the barrel lug, and the slide stop or slide release lever. Now let's put them back together. All right. Okay, so we're ready to put the barrel back in. The barrel link is forward. We're going to insert the barrel through the muzzle end of the slide and push it back until it stops and put the link forward or rearward and then we put the spring guide on there with the u-shaped part facing down like that and then we'll insert the spring to engage the spring guide kind of holds it in position now we're going to put the frame assembly line it up with the rails and move it forward to about there and then turn it over and we're going to retract the slide Okay, there we go. Alright, next we put the slide stop lever in, push it into its place. A little detent right there. Slide forward all the way. Now, barrel lug back in. Start over on this side until it engages the lug. And then through the spring. Okay, now it's engaged there with the lug inside and that barrel link won't come off. Then all we have to do is put the spring guy, spring plug, put the spring plug, push it back in, hold pressure on it, rotate the barrel lug there, it's sprung, it's snapped back together, function test it, it goes, and that pistol is back together again and clean. So I mentioned earlier that I like to lubricate things. So right here, you can see inside where the grooves are for the barrel or the slide rails. And I'll put a little drop of lubricant in there and let it go forward. 
a little drop here, and a little drop right there. And hold the gun muzzle down like this and allow that lubricant to flow. Earlier, you may recall, we lubricated the hammer on its pivot pin. Okay, so we'll retract the slide and let it go forward gently. And this is where I told you that I'll come around in here with a clean patch, reasonably so. Wipe off some of the excess lubricant that makes its way to the surface when we do that. That I'm doing, working the action here, and that'll bring some of the lubricant out right there. Sometimes some of it'll show up along the edge right here. It isn't really necessary to remove it unless you're in a dirty environment or you have a nice leather holster that you don't want to have get. Uh, over time oily. Now what about dry firing a 45 uh, 1911A1 or clone? No problem. Doesn't hurt anything. Now these come with a half cock notch on them and full cock and then this is the uh, slide lever safety. Prevents the slide from coming back, prevents the trigger from being pulled. This is a grip safety. So in order to fire this gun you have to release the slide lever safety and engage the grip safety with your web of your thumb. Then you can pull the trigger and the hammer will drop. And we're getting a little oil come off of the trigger and that's fine. Just wipe it up. Kind of clean all around all the little nooks and crannies that show up. Okay, so we have a clean and lubed firearm. Now what? Well, I'm going to wash my hands because I'm going to handle ammunition next and I don't want to get any oil or solvent residue from my hands onto the ammunition. It could make its way to the primer and conceivably deaden the primer so they don't go off. So we'll be back in just a minute with clean hands. Okay. Got a rag to kind of wipe it down a little bit more. Stainless steel. This is a really nice brushed satin finish on this particular firearm. The position you see right now with the hammer back to full cock and the slide lock lever engaged, this is called cocked and locked. And if there were a round of ammunition in that weapon at this point that would be called condition one which means you have a round in the chamber full magazine and you're in cocked and locked position that's the proper way to carry a 45 automatic some people like to carry in condition two which means you have a round in the chamber full magazine and the hammer at half cock or all the way down I wouldn't recommend having it all the way down. If you drop it, it could go off depending on the particular model that you own. But anyway, that's condition two. Some people like to carry in condition three, which, uh, depending on who it is and their preference, could be with the hammer down all the way on an empty chamber and a fully charged magazine in the magazine well. Uh, that's not my preference because it requires you to rack the slide in order to chamber around and when the crap hits the fan you may not have time to do that you may only have time to draw and fire and if you have to stop and rack the slide to get a loaded chamber loaded round under the chamber um, that may cost you your life or someone else's so it's an individual preference you'll never find me carrying in a condition two or three uh, any firearm that functions the way this one does. Uh, 
to talk about safeties, this gun has more than two. There's two visible ones. Inside there's also another one that prevents the hammer theoretically from falling onto um, a live round if you drop it and it strikes the hammer on a solid surface. This has a beaver tail safety on it. It's called a beaver tail safety. It extends way beyond the edge of the hammer so you'd have to... I can't see a, a way where if that was in condition two if you dropped it it could possibly strike the hammer. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, I don't know. But I'm not going to worry about that because I don't carry it in condition two. But you may choose to do so. Alright, so let's charge the magazine. I'm going to wipe it off first with this clean rag. And you can see there's still a little fouling that's coming off it, and that's typical. And so, we're going to set the firearm aside for a moment. We're going to retrieve the ammunition from where I put it. And I'm not going to set it down on this particular cloth because there's a lot of solvent on there, so I'll put it on this one. These are, what does he carry in here? Spear brand, I believe those are 230 grain um, gold dot hollow points is what they look like. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's how many we need. So how I like to hold a magazine and load it, I put my thumb just about even with the case mouth and stick it up a little bit and push down on the round brace it with my thumb and just repeat that process until we have seven rounds in there. Proper way to charge a 45 automatic insert the magazine give it a slap release the slide stop keep your finger off the trigger withdraw the slide let it go forward engage the slide stop safety now we have a round in the chamber. Muzzle needs to be pointed in a safe direction all the time, and it is right now. If I were on the firing range, I would have never, uh, once I started that operation, the muzzle of the gun would never be pointed anywhere except downrange toward the steel backstop. Now this has six rounds in it, so to restore it to being a full magazine, now it has seven. Again, muzzle pointed downrange, finger off the trigger magazine in the well, slap it in there, it's ready to go. Now if I were to disengage the slide stop safety and, and disen put my uh, and grip the grip the firearm with the web of my thumb like that and pull the trigger, that firearm is going to discharge. But it's not going to as long as I keep my finger off the trigger and no matter what else I do to it, it's not going to go off. I'm going to restore it back to its position in a gun rug and it's ready to go. This is how he likes it. Cocked and locked and loaded. And that's that. We're going to clean up our work area here. And we'll be back in just a few minutes to talk about the giveaway. Okay, we're back. And here is our 200 subscriber giveaway prize. This is a CRKT Ritter RSK Mark V and it comes in its own little tin. You can make your own survival kit out of it. However, I have called this Fire and Light and I'll show you why in a minute. If you watch some of my earlier videos, I think I demonstrated what's in this once before. I haven't used any of these things. I've had them for quite some time. They're all brand new or all fresh off the tree, whichever the case may be. So let's take a look inside. Here we have some birch bark off my own personal birch tree. We have wet fire tinder cube, still sealed in its original pouch. We have char cloth, and there are a few pieces of it. They're pretty big. I made this char cloth out of an old t-shirt, I think it was. Well, there's four nice strips of char cloth there. We have a brand new 
light my fire Swedish fire steel for sparking. We have a tender quick tender cube. It looks a little gray and dusty because it's been in there with the char cloth, but it's brand new. We have a striker for the fire steel. And we have the Ritter RSK Mark V. You can make this a neck knife or you can keep it in the kit, which is what I would do. And before we move on to look at that, here's a set of instructions. Picture of Doug Ritter. I think that's his name. Yep, Doug Ritter. And all the things that you can do with this. And how you can make a survival kit out of this tin. Now let's take a look at the knife. It has a Kydex sheath. It's riveted in a couple of places. It has another small lanyard loop right there that's brass. To remove the knife from the sheath, you put your thumb along the upper edge of the handle and push. And it comes out. So it's all stainless steel with a bead blasted or sand blasted finish. It's quite sharp and you can use it for different chores. You could conceivably tie it to a stick and make a spear of sorts, but this would be your cutting tool primarily. It's adequate for small game and even big game size of a deer if you know what you're doing. It doesn't weigh very much. I'm going to knock out some of these little fragments of birch bark out of there. In the top of the tin I've placed a list of the contents. CRKT Ritter RSK Mark V with tin and the lanyard Swedish fire steel striker, three function mini flashlight. It's very bright, has a dimmer switch and a flashing pulse and then off. On, two clicks is dimmer, dimmer setting, three clicks flash and off. So that's in there. It takes a 2032 battery, actually takes two of them. And these should have quite a bit of life left in them because other than just the demonstration um, now they haven't had any use at all. I just got that so uh, to put in this kit. So there we have the ingredients. Let's take a look at how you might use some of them. Okay we're back we're all cleaned up and let's take a look at some of the ingredients inside that fire and light kit. How we might use them to start a fire. You know how you can use a flashlight so we won't demonstrate that any further. There's a piece of char cloth. I'm going to use another ferro rod that I have because I haven't used the one that's in that kit yet and I don't want to. So what we're going to do is throw some sparks onto the char cloth and hopefully we'll demonstrate um, that they're there. So here we go. Now I'm going to turn the light off. And there you can see them. Got good ember on the end of that. pretty hot. It's on both sides. So what you would do at this point is wrap this up in your timber, tinder bundle. Uh, maybe the fluff out of a tule head or something. And then uh, gently close it around there and blow and blow and blow or wave it in the air until you got a flame. Now that's pretty hot. I can feel the heat coming off of that. And that'll just continue to glow with embers as long as you don't snuff them out like I just did. See, I'm blowing on it a little bit. So that's how char cloth works. Secondly, we have a little bit of birch bark here, and I'm going to take my knife and just kind of scratch around till we get some powder there. We're going to be using the 
ferro rod that I just used on the char cloth. But in the case of the lucky winner of this kit, you can use the ferro rod that's the Swedish steel, Swedish fire steel. I want to get a little bit of dust there. And this should work. It's worked before. There we go. And birch bark burns with a lot of smoke. I'm going to see if I can extinguish it. I don't know how I can because I didn't bring something along to do that, unfortunately. Hope that doesn't set off my smoke detector. So this is very oily. I'll have to clean this knife blade, but you may be able to see the residue on there. And the next little trick we're going to do is to scratch up the surface of this. This is one of those little tinder cube type things. Again, what we want to do is just make a little more surface area for the sparks to get a hold of. I may get blasted by the powers that be around here for using this dish. I don't know. hope not. I'm going to try to clean it up before she gets home. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm scratching up some fibers here. Uh, hopefully we'll catch the spark. They look like they could. Just a matter of technique. Being somewhat See, that was pretty easy. So that will burn for three or four minutes pretty easily. And uh, the bonus part, when I cut this into three pieces, I ended up with three pieces of tinder. These are somewhat easier to get out. You can just blow them out. So that covers the fire making equipment that's inside the kit. You saw the flashlight work and the knife self-explanatory for a cutting tool. And that's what the lucky winner is going to have sent to them once we conduct the drawing. So it's Apple Stump Bushcraft Stuff and Things. Glad to have you with us. Have a happy new year and we'll see you next time. Take care. Stay safe.